Welcome to Beyond. We're coming to you from Newport Beach, California. I have an insanely special guest today. I'm really excited to share her story. Dr. Betty Uribe is an internationally best-selling author with her book, uh, Hashtag Values. And we'll talk more about this, but it's been uh, endorsed by the Vatican, um, by Stephen Covey, um, by uh, Inc. Magazine as a 60 top best bo business books in the world. She's been recognized by Fortune Magazine's top 50 most powerful Latina uh, in business 2017 and 18. I wouldn't be surprised 2019. Uh, she's received a special commendation by the president of Columbia. Uh, she's the first woman in history to be inducted into the Rose Ball Foundation board. Um, she's been instrumental in changing the trajectory of how the World Bank approaches projects to eliminate world hunger. Pretty, pretty important, I would say. Um, she recently won um, a Global Woman's Award for which um, she'll be traveling to London in July of 2019. Uh, she will address the European Parliament this year. She was inv invited by Tony Guaga, yes. hope I didn't say that wrong, who is in uh, charge of the Women's Global Conference in Luxembourg. I'm sorry, no, no, he's in charge of uh, the Euro European Parliament. Yes, Okay. of um, the Women's Initiatives for the European Parliament. The Women's Initiatives, thank you. And she'll present at the Women's Global Conference in Luxembourg. Um, and this is by Princess of Luxembourg, who's putting on this event in her country. Yes, and you know, I just found out she's the Duchess. She's the Duchess. Yes. Okay. I had it wrong. All right. So my apologies. So, the, okay, the Duchess, thank you. Uh, the Duchess of Luxembourg, thank you. Um, she's keynoted at numerous global women's conferences in 2018 and 19. She's helped build a school in Kenya, Africa, 2019, and is currently providing full university scholarships for 53 underserved, mostly Latino kids who will graduate with zero debt from Chapman College. This is 2017. 18, 19, 20, and 21. I mean, how with huge is that? With a little help from my friends. With a little a help. With a lot of help. With a lot friends. of help that she put together on her initiative. Um, and she's provided university scholarships in Kenya, Africa for the last five years. And her goal, and this is huge, is to provide 100 full university scholarships for underserved kids in each continent by the time she's 80 years old. Currently, she is halfway through the Americas. And she's also dined with presidents. What an inspiring, inspiring journey, Betty, and, and it's only just begun. Yes, it feels that way. So we had a, we had a great conversation before for coming on the show, and I just want to give a sense for the audience, where did this all start for you? Because you got another full-time job in addition to what you're doing, and you got the energy of three teenagers combined in one. So where did this journey start for you, this passion? You know, it started with the day uh, my mother, who was 45 years old at the time, I was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, and she sat my brothers and I down, and she said, uh, I can't live like this anymore. Your father, my father was a millionaire, he had a transportation company, uh, but there was this deep secret, you know, he was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And he used to come home and beat her up. And after he almost killed her, I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, a few days after that, she sat us down and she said, I need to leave. I can't live like this. You can stay here and you will never need anything. Or you can go with me. I don't know what's waiting for us in the United States. My Aunt Ruby used to live here, or still does. Um, but she said, whatever's waiting for us, peace will be with us and we'll be able to just have peace. So all four of us and I made, made the decision to come. So I think that was the nucleus. It was my very first value-based decision where the core value of being able to have peace, being able to go to church when we wanted to, being able to uh, be, just be, rather than living in a life of luxury all of a sudden the money didn't matter and it was I think one of the biggest lessons that I learned from my mother but in 24 hours in an airplane ride we became poor everything changed. so what's interesting everything is changed. the juxtaposition of you're living in, in luxury money's there and present but there's no peace yet your mother found peace in making a decision to literally come to America and pursue a route that would really lead to poverty in comparison yes. initially. Yes. And yet she found peace in that moment. And that she must have did. been so profound for you as a young girl looking at your mother's strength and looking at that choice, which was which was transformational for your family, I would think. It was. If you think about being a 12-year-old young lady, these are the formative years. This is when you begin to form your character, who you are. 
so many different things. And, and we went to church. When we came back from church, my dad would be waiting to beat us all up because he just said, you know, you don't, you, you're with another man or he always judged. And so to, to think about what is most important and to get congruent with what's most important. For us or for my mother and the lessons, the initial lessons from this particular decision were what is most important in your life and think about, I just had a meeting with some ladies this, this morning that I meet with once a month, and, it, and we were talking about this. If you think fast, fast forward five years and figure out what is going to be important five years from now that you did today, what are you going to remember? And I think my mother did that. What's gonna be most important when my children grow up? What lessons do I need to teach them? Oh my God, I, I get... Um, very emotional because I put myself in my mother's shoes because I'm a mother now and I have three children and I do that all the time is and that's what keeps me centered what is it that's going to matter in the future that I need to act toward today today so when you made that transition to America at 12 yeah. what were challenges you encountered on that journey coming to America Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, I was daddy's little girl. Mm -hmm. I was the only girl. I was the princess. I still am the princess, I think. <laughs> I act like one sometimes anyway. Um, but being the princess and being my daddy's little girl and having to leave my daddy for a little girl, it doesn't matter what he does. And, and you know, the alcoholism I learned later is a disease. And, and he did apologize. He came to the United States. People ask me about that. So he did come and apologize to my mom and my, and my, my brothers and I. But I think to answer your question, coming to America as um, someone who was very popular in school, I did very well in school. I have a picture with the family with my little medals. I always got medals because I did really well in school. To come to America to be invisible. Mm. I wasn't hurt because I didn't speak the language. I looked different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And in Colombia, I was very popular. I was the most popular girl in school and very active. So to come here, I had this burning desire to learn the language and to become somebody right. because I became nobody. That was very, uh, it, it was huge for me not to have my dad, not to have my family, my cousins that I grew up with. Uh, all I had was just my brothers and us, but my mother and us became such a nucleus and so tight that we were determined that we were going to succeed together. So it just bonded us tremendously. What you say is so powerful because you basically lost your identity, yes. your financial support, yes. everything that you'd known up to that point to come to a new country and deal with probably some racism at some level, deal with those dynamics, yes. having no identity at a formative age of 12 going into 13. Um, that's, it doesn't get any more palpable than that. But then take us through about how did you establish and set about to establish your identity and your character in that, you know, because if you're coming to a country and you're not showing the same love or respect, right, or the admiration, and you're coming into a culture having had this experience in life and then it's transformed into something less than ideal, mm -hmm. how, what, what steps did you take to establish about who you were your value system, despite all these odds, despite all these sort of headwinds? Wow, that's a very good question. It's also a very deep one. I think when I think back at that moment in arriving in the United States, living with my Aunt Ruby, it was really interesting because my Aunt Ruby and my Uncle Ivan, they were in their honeymoon practically. They'd only been married for about a year. And here come five people to live in their home. So my mother, on our way here, she said, okay, you're gonna not, you can't let them know that you're even at the house. Don't make a lot of noise, take a shower before they wake up so that they don't feel like we're all there. So my mother, it was almost like she put us through military training <laughs> before coming <laughs> sure. so that we would be welcome. So we were always, of course, we were all, all about service, all about being of service. The other piece, I think for me, our faith was huge. 
And so we didn't know we were poor. My mother celebrated every little thing. And today I celebrate. Every day I find something to celebrate. I call Juan Carlos, let's go celebrate. Yeah. So that was another thing. And, and I think the value, the core values that my mother found in the church and the Bible in reading um, and in singing gospel songs and so forth, uh, I think those were very instrumental in keeping us aligned with what was most important. One story I tell usually is my Aunt Ruby sat me down at the table, and I'll never forget this day. She said, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to teach you etiquette because someday you're going to dine with the President of the United States. And you, you would think a little girl, 12 years old, I had nothing. There was no reason to tell me something like that. And yet, 14 years later, I was dining with President Bush Sr. That is amazing. Go figure. Right. So it's a huge lesson on parenthood what your parents tell you. My mother told me you are super intelligent and you can get to anywhere. You can be the president of the United States. She didn't know you have to be born here. Right. <laughs> but she told me you can do anything you want. And today, I really have no boundaries. I don't think of boundaries. I think of stepping stones. Or, okay, what do I have to go around to get to this place? Or if I need to meet somebody, I just ask. What's amazing about your mother is she had a choice to make in Colombia. I could become bitter, angry, or better. And I took the better route that transformed the legacy of my kids to then produce a young woman and a daughter like yourself to go out and impact the world. And that's a choice we all have, right? Um, hashtag values is all about hashtag choices ultimately and the alignment of that. And it's, it's so powerful to, to hear the strength of your mother, the strength in her religion and belief in God and how it transformed your life and how what you saw in America, despite a lot of obstacles, I would argue, because I think you mentioned you set out to learn the language uh, three weeks. Is that fair? <laughs> three months. Three months, uh, sorry, three months. Yeah, I wanted to learn the language very quickly. And I, so I got uh, a dictionary for my backpack, a dictionary in the bathroom, a dictionary uh, to carry around with me. I had dictionaries and they were marked, they were earmarked and written all over. And, and then I would practice the words in front of the mirror, like refrigerator was the toughest word for me to learn. And I would just practice it until I got it just right. I wanted to learn it, but I wanted to learn it perfectly. Like I didn't even want to have an, I do have an accent, but I didn't want to have an accent. I wanted to do this right. And I wanted to devour that dictionary <laughs> to right. learn the language so that I could be somebody, so that I could be normal. Because all of a sudden I was a nobody. I was abnormal in the eyes of other people. I remember people screaming at me because they thought I couldn't hear. But we do this to people but we that don't didn't speak English. Right, exactly. Go figure. Yeah, right. go figure. That's us. So three months, roughly, you learn the three language. Yeah, in three months, people thought that. So that Rosetta Stone has nothing on your technique. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Start your own company. So the other thing I think is fascinating about your journey is, you know, you got your undergraduate master's, and then you worked on a doctorate. And um, you really put a big, audacious goal in front of yourself, which is clear about your journey. Um, to achieve getting this degree, so if you can sort of uh, illuminate for the audience, what was that goal that you put in terms of going to your doctorate at Pepperdine? I wanted to finish my doctorate in three years. And the normal is? And the, well, five, six five, years. Five, six years, okay. And so I remember after finishing, the, my first semester there was somebody that came in and, and she talked about uh, how she organized herself so that she could finish her dissertation and I thought, Oh, okay, so that's what I need to do. So I, st I knew what I, the path I was going to take. And so I told my professors and I told the administration that I was going to finish in three years. And they said, it's impossible. You can't do it in three years. And I said, well, how about I try? Would you just let me try? And so they said, sure, but it's not going to happen. So I backed into it and I figured out, okay, how many hours do I need to sleep? How, how many hours can my body go without sleep? And then how many hours do I need to spend quality time with my children? So back to my core values. What was most important to me was my schooling, my job, my education, well, I said my education, my children, and then being able to either go to church or watch church or listen to church. And so I figured, okay, well, it takes me 20 minutes to go 
five minutes, 10 minutes to park, another hour, two hours for the service, another, I mean, I, I got it just like that. So I figured, okay, well, I can save an hour of commute, driving, getting to my chair, and I'll just watch the service from my computer. So, and then that hour, I could write so many words, and I mean, it was like that. So you had your schedule down to the minute. Down to the minute. Down, and I learned that, and so that's why people ask me all the time, how can you do so much today? Well, I train myself. Right. So I, I graduated in three years. So what did in that do to the years. program's expectation of future graduates? <laughs> it was wonderful because <laughs> Farzine Majidi, who, Dr. Farzine, I love him to pieces from Pepperdine University, uh, Graduate School of Education and Psychology. He said to me later, he said, hey, now we have a model. We put together the model and people are now graduating in three years. Wow. So it's great. It's great. That is amazing. That is amazing. So let's uh, transition. Um, you came out with this amazing book, Hashtag Values that again has been endorsed by the Vatican, uh, by Stephen Covey. Um, I'm looking at a list here, um, Mario Soto, Michael Gerber, Bob Carr. Um, we've got the Washington uh, Post Writers Group, uh, Ruben, Nav Nav was it? Navarrete. Navarrete. Uh, you know, what, let's start with what inspired you to write the book? What's missing? And the, the title's very fascinating because I think values in today's culture and society are lacking, are missing. Because um, if, you, if you try to replace it with something higher, God or something, what are you replacing it with is a fundamental question. Yes. So I'd be curious to sort of explore the genesis of the book and then find out how on God's green earth did you get these people to endorse it? So the genesis of the book came from when the economic downturn happened. I started looking and my children were still small, the girls were anyway. Uh, my boy was already in college. But when the economic turn, downturn happened, if you look at the leaders and the people, the role models in different areas, they started falling. The people in sports, in academia, in government, people started falling. And even in clergy, they started falling. And the common denominator that I saw was that they made decisions that were incongruent with what they said their core values were. Mm. And I was thinking as a parent, who are gonna be the role models for my children when they grow up if all of these people that are way up here all of a sudden make a bad decision and fall immediately. There've got to be some really good value-based leaders. The other piece was performance and how do you create sustainable performance leading with values how do you permeate those values through an organization and continue to create sustainable performance? I had been doing that in banking in my career, but I needed to find other people that were also value-based leaders who were leading large organizations. I was leading at the time a $5 billion, $6 billion operation. And so how do I find other people? So I sought out to do an actual study so that I could race up leaders, the people that are in the book, mm -hmm. Bob Carr, the pe I have generals from the White House and the Pentagon, I have CEOs there, and all the common denominator between all of these folks is they're value-based leaders who lead with values, who permeate those values through their organization, and they create high-performing teams, because at, at the end of the day, you've got to perform. Mm -hmm. So that was the genesis of the book. Wow. And you know, today's society, it's all about pop culture, surface, um, transactional, right? It's not real, not rooted, not grounded. Correct. And what you're talking about is something that's sustainable for any organization if they apply it and they, you know, they it stay is. focused on it. So it that's, is. It is. It doesn't get any more powerful than that. So how did you get all those people to endorse it? I mean, the, the, the topic is obviously critical. Yes. But now you've got some very well-known, powerful names to say, no, this was amazing material an important book. How, how'd you go about that process? I'll give you one example. I just asked, but I'll give you one example. For example, uh, Concordia University brought uh, Stephen Covey Jr., the author of uh, uh, the, the book on trust, The Speed of Trust. And I went to see him and to watch, so I showed up an hour early. If you want to know, if you want to get somewhere, show up an hour early because that's where the speakers are putting their microphones on and so forth. So I did that. Stephen was there 
And I, I just went up to him and I said, hey, Stephen, my name is Betty. I wasn't Dr. Betty yet. My name is Betty. Oh, yeah, my name is Dr. Betty, and I have the last manuscript of my book. In fact, you know, you write about trust, and I write about values. We should do something together. And he looked at me as if, who are you? You're an alien. Who is this person? <laughs> right? Who are you? It was really funny. And I said, well, you know, the, the, the Vatican endorsed my book. In fact, I just received the letter from the Vatican. Would you like to see it? And so I looked for it in my PDA. He says, yes, I want to see it. I'm thinking he's just going to read like the first two letters. Oh, no. There was time because I showed up an hour early. So he sat there. He read a page and a half letter from Monsignor Giacomo Papalardo from the Vatican. And he looked at me, he said, oh my gosh. So immediately, I don't know, something told me, ask him to endorse it. So I said, would you entertain endorsing my book? And he looked at me, he said, well, I'd have to read it first. I said, oh, I have a manuscript. I, it's in my car. It's my last manuscript. In fact, I was going to read it over the weekend because right. it's getting ready to go to print. But I would love for you to do that. And he said, you know, if you're good enough for the Vatican, I guess you're good enough for me. Wow. Go ahead and bring me the manuscript. And then I said, oh, by the way, but I do need it by Sunday at 5 o'clock. <laughs> do you know that by 5 o'clock on Sunday, he sent me not just a little blurb, but a whole letter saying wow. uh, more than just what he wrote. So show up early and Being ask. Being a champion. Show up early and ask. And don't be afraid. Don't wow. be afraid. They're just people just like us. Awesome. So... Talking about the book, what does the title say about our abundance or lack of values in society? Ooh. I think in today's environment, people are making decisions that are going that are giving them immediate satisfaction mm -hmm. without thinking about the ramifications of their decisions and what that does as leaders, what those decisions will do for the people that are following. People are watching us. I just finished writing an article that's going into the Los Angeles Business Journal yesterday, and I wrote this. People are watching us. Just like as parents, our children watch our actions and they learn from our actions. Mm -hmm. Our employees, our communities, the people that follow us on social media, they're watching for congruency and they're looking for they're starving for role models. They're starving for people that are true to themselves, people who are just people. We don't need to be anybody else. We just need to be, just be ourselves. So the core values that we were born and raised with, when we are aligned with those core values and we have our actions follow those core values, that's where the true magic happens. Because it's effortless. It is. doesn't require any thinking. You don't have to worry about looking behind your, your head because somebody's following. You don't have to worry about making up something because you have to make it up to, so that the puzzle fits. Right. You don't have to worry about what you're going to tell your spouse where you were. Right. You don't have to worry about telling your boss something or fabricating numbers so that your company looks better. If you are just you and you are congruent with your core values. Now, there are values that are not the right values, right? There's mm -hmm. positive values. There's, you know, the, the value sure. of richness or, or, or money over matter or whatever. Right. But if you, if you are just congruent, then tr that's where trust happens. If you, people know, you know, Stephen Covey and others talk about, you know, making deposits. Mm -hmm. You make enough deposits into the relationship bank. If you have to make a withdrawal, if you're always on time, and then all of a sudden you're late, somebody's not going to say, oh, he's late again right. or she's late again. They're going to say, something must matter. Something right. must happen. Something this happen. is not like them. Mm -hmm. So this is how you build trust. This is how you build relationship. This is how you build communion, community. This is how, how you build a family. This is how you build a city. This is how you build a municipality. This is how you build a government. This is how you build the world. It's very simple. Right. Very simple. But it applies all throughout our, our world. Simple but seemingly complicated for a lot of people. Yes. 
That's powerful. Back after this message from our sponsor. Serenitex is focused on eliminating the biggest challenge to migraine management, namely the subjective diagnosis of migraines and standard migraine drug therapy that results in undesirable effects and unproven results. Healthcare and lost productivity costs from migraines is $78 billion a year, and employers lose 113 million lost workdays from migraines. But did you know that more than 95% of those with chronic migraines have never sought help, received a diagnosis, or been treated? Serenitex has discovered a patentable technology solution for the non-invasive detection and screening of migraines. We've tested our approach on actual migraine patients, and it works. To learn more, visit serenitex.com. Welcome back. So, uh, you know, in your experience, in your journey, there's so many people clearly that have inspired you, influenced you, and you have this just epic pathway that you're on. But who's that person who's had the most influence on your personal or professional development? Um, when you ask me for one person, it's really difficult because there hasn't been uh, just the one individual because there have been so many people in my life that have formed and, and, and reformed my way of thinking. Uh, you know, when you think of Aristotle, when he, his line of questioning and, and how intuitive he was, or when you think of Leonardo da Vinci, and he was just so amazing in, in, in health and airplanes, and I mean, he did so much. And then you think of Einstein, oh my gosh, trying so many different things. But I think if I had to tell you, you know, Mother Teresa, my goodness, poor, she didn't have one penny to her name, and yet she had everything she needed, and she was able to propagate a beautiful word for the entire world to see. But I think if I had to go back, um, in addition to my mother who gave me my values and who mm -hmm. made that decision that we talked about, mm -hmm. I think that the life of Jesus Christ when he was on the, on the earth, mm -hmm. and, and if you look at it, not so much from a religious perspective, but if you look at his life from a leadership perspective. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a look at an academic approach to his life. If you look at him walking the earth with such humility, if you look at him surrounding himself with the 12 apostles, who in my mind are statistically significant sampling of the population at the time, if you look at each one of the people that he surrounded himself, I always say we don't do this alone, and he didn't. He always had someone that he was teaching so that he, and he gave freely, mm -hmm. was freely given to him. So I, I think I would have to go with Jesus Christ walking the earth. That, for me, uh, there's a book that uh, we read uh, called The Leadership Lessons of Jesus. From a leadership perspective, the humility, the being able to be bold, even in, the, in, the, in front of people who were apparently more powerful than him, uh, the wisdom, the going away to really think. And as leaders, we have to think. We have to, we, I make the, mo the best decisions when I meditate, when I think, when I take the time and not be hasty. The living according to your values and not compromising. The taking care of the little ones and taking care of the people who are wounded and who are hurt. So look at it from a leadership perspective and I don't I can't think of anybody better well uh, in terms of influencing life I don't think there's a, a bigger influence and I think there's uh, several billion people on the planet earth that uh, are followers of Jesus and there's a lot of reasons why and uh, he, he's definitely had a huge impact in so many people's lives not only back then but cur currently uh, in, in present times um, as you as you look back um, you know your your yeah you know, your experiences are what they are what are one or two pearls of uh, success or wisdom you could offer the audience. Like do these one or two things, imply these one or two principles, you could transform your personal or professional life. What would they be? The first thing I would say is be yourself. Be comfortable in your own skin. Don't try to be somebody else. And when you show up as yourself, not try to put a code on that looks like someone else, but show up 100% of you as yourself there is a level of confidence that happens when you realize that you are enough. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You don't need to be more than anything. There is no such thing as a hundred and X percent. It's a hundred percent. Just be yourself. That would be one thing that I would say. Give away freely without expecting anything in return. Not even a thank you. When we give unconditionally, we, without expecting anything, it's almost like living in abundance right. in your life. And if you talk to billionaires, I just came back from Sir Richard Branson's private island with filled with billionaires in November, December of last year. And, and when you talk to the people that are very affluent in the world and you see that they're aligned with their values, they give and they give away freely. They're not expecting that thank you. They're not expecting that they're going to give because they're going to be receiving. And I'm not saying that you have to be a billionaire or you have to want to be a billionaire. That's not something for me right now. But I can tell you that you have abundance in your life, abundance of the things that matter, right. abundance of joy, abundance of love, abundance of trust, abundance of values, abundance of social capital that you can use. As an executive running a $6 billion operation today, I can tell you the social capital that I have because I lead with values. People trust that if I do a handshake, I can just with a handshake. I bought a 111 acre place in Texas on a handshake just mm. because of my word. I didn't have to sign a document. Right. Those are the things that, that, that you can do um, just based on your word. And then the last thing that I would say is realize and be humble, in, humble enough to know that we don't do it alone. When you get to the top, it really isn't you who gets to the top. It's the people that support you to get you there that are part of this, I call it a tribe, that are part of your tribe that really you should bring with you and then never forget where you came from right. and reach back and bring others with you. It's, it's very lonely at the top otherwise. Right. That's sage advice. Thank you. That's, that's powerful. Is there a motto you live your life by? Uh, we don't do this alone. It's powerful. That's, that's, in today's world, that's really important advice. Is there anything you'd like to tell the audience we haven't covered? There's a lot that we haven't covered. Uh, I think if I were to leave your audience with a message, that would be, Lead with values. Live your, understand what's most important to you. If you want to know what's most important to somebody, take an inventory of your calendar. For the last three months, take a look at what actions you took in your calendar, and are they aligned with the top five things that are most important to you? Oh, that's if they're a good not, one. then that's how you know. And then take a look at your bank account. What did you spend your money on? So money and time two commodities that we all have. How do you spend it and squeeze every second of value out of life? Because we don't have a pink slip when we are born. It's a finite amount of time that we're on this earth. What are you going to use this time with and for? How are you going to use it? That's awesome. That's huge, right? Um, where can they learn more and find out more about you? Where could they go? They can go to my website, um, drbettyuribe.com, uh, and I'm on social media, Dr. Betty Uribe everything. So <laughs> LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and, uh, and YouTube. The usual places. The usual places, yes. Awesome. But I do read all, all of the messages from LinkedIn. So okay. if, if anybody wants to get a hold of me personally, send me a LinkedIn message. I will personally respond to it. Wonderful. You know, we can go on and on for two hours because before the show we talked and she has so many stories that are powerful that really point out a lot of the principles you live your life by. So it's wonderful. So that's it from Beyond. Wardrobe today provided by John Varvedos, South Coast Plaza. Look for Jose. He set me up today. They're wonderful people over there. Of course, you can find Beyond Ben Bobo on the internet with LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. And remember, until next time, becoming is better than being.
When we founded Stradling in 1975, we made a commitment to helping our clients to succeed and create opportunities for business growth throughout California and beyond. Our people share cutting-edge focus in guiding the critical transactions and disputes of our clients, and we've developed a deep bench of contacts and resources to get the job done. As trusted advisors to technology, life science, software, and medical device companies, we've invested in building our expertise, developing the best of legal talent and the readiness to serve the business community. From our commitment to our clients to our deep involvement in the communities we serve, we understand our job is your success.